this is the ASMR medic. I hope you're well. Today I thought I'd take you over a standard pre-lecture kind of either it's sometimes it's a refresher, sometimes it's just a kind of make sure that I'm prepared well enough for the, the lecture to come. And tomorrow I have my first ever lecture on neuroanatomy. Now to be quite honest, it's not exactly neuroanatomy. It's actually neuroscience, um, but I'm going to be going over the anatomy part of it. Um, I think that makes for good, uh, interesting kind of uh, videos. And, uh, it's the way that I like to revise first, before I get into the nitty-gritty of the physiology of a particular organ or, uh, or system. I really do feel like uh, the anatomy is where you know, it's best to start, to get an idea of what we're talking about, what's the area, and um, from there you can really, that's where you can really build from. So we're going to be talking about the cranium today. Um, I thought, I thought it might be, uh, might be best if we, uh, if we uh, use some internet sources rather than the book, uh, simply because uh, I'm going to be learning about what are these, what these different anatomical structures do. Um, and some uh, anatomy books don't give you a true um, outline of what they do. It's more sort of this particular structure is called this, and then you need to find another source uh, from which you can get the, the, the physiological explanations, or if not the physiological explanations, just at least w what it does. And what I thought I would do is, generally speaking, I want to look at the anatomy of the cranium, draw it out, do some of the things I did in my first video, and second, um, but also I wanted to look over these, which are the, for my university, uh, it's called the Intended Learning Objectives, so I wanted to see if I could get through some of these, so this is the first one, the second, the third, the first one saying here to understand the protective role of the cranium for the brain and sensory organs, uh, the second become familiar with how the brain fits into the cranium, become familiar with the meningeal part partitions, dural venous sinuses, and the clinical relevance of meningeal spaces, CSF, which stands for cerebral spinal fluid, uh, circulation and the spinal meninges. Some of you may uh, recognise the word uh, meninges or meningeal, uh, which you probably recognise from the, from the uh, disease meningitis, which is simply an uh, infection of the meninges, the meninges being one of the protective, well, three protective layers of the brain, and is pretty much where my knowledge of the brain begins and ends. Um, so that is the la first and last piece of insight into the into the into the brain that comes directly from me. The rest will come from my favourite uh, anatomy website, teachmeanatomy.info. So I'll link that in the description below if you're interested or if first of all if you're a medical student you'll definitely find it find it useful um, i think it really does give a, a good overview usually they they'll give you a, first of all like i said a general overview so in terms of the cranium they'll talk about uh, what the cranium is where you can, where you can find it and what do you really do with that uh, what, what that uh, what that anatomical structure does what the role is broadly speaking. Then some sort of surrounding things within this, this uh, particular section, the one that I found uh, that is most related to this subject, the cranium, was the bones of the skull. So that obviously does in involve th things like uh, facial bones, so jaw, uh, mandible, nasal areas, etc. We will be skipping over that, but then it does go into things like sutures of the skull, which I'm almost certain these are not on the internal learning objectives, but I did want to just kind of look at some specific things because the protective role. Let's make that a little bit larger, such as the uh, let's use the protective role of the cranium for the brain. So obviously I'll be looking over the meninges. Become familiar with how the brain fits into the cranium. So that's why it'd be useful to look at things like sutures and the shape of the inside of the skull. So become familiar with the meningeal partitions. Dural venous sinuses, clinical relevance for meningeal spaces, 
and I'm going to leave those ones, so most of everything within below this line, the third one, I'm going to leave to my lecture, because things like clinical relevance, I don't need to look over myself, it's good for the lecture to kind of introduce that to me, I think. Uh, so yes, one and two, I'm going to look over myself, and maybe not specifically, so I don't think, I don't think that we're going to be addressing those questions directly, it's definitely going to be a dark blue. It's quite a professional colour. It gets me in the mood. <laughs> it might seem silly to you. Yeah. The cranium. Okay. Let's get some general info down first before we start. Also known as the neurocranium. Make this wave one. Here is the neurocranium. Apologies for my bad handwriting. Something I've been ailed uh, with my entire life. Unavoidable, I'm afraid. Tried to correct it over time, but. They say doctors have bad handwriting. <laughs> Such people are insane. Okay, new cranium is formed by the, the superior aspect. I'm reading the, under this title of the cranium. It's formed by the superior aspect of the skull. superior. That would be the inferior. Well, I guess they would overlap so they've got a bit well, you see exactly you see what I'm saying. But um label that just for the uh for your sake. Superior aspect. and protects the brain meninges and cerebral vasculature vasculature res re re um, related to anything well vascular so anything to do with vessels so that could be uh, arteries veins arterioles smaller venules uh, and those eventually form capillaries the arterioles
cerebral vasculature. Anatomically, the cranium can be subdivided into a roof, which I use the alvarium, and a base. Is the calvary calvary something I've never heard of before? Or base, really. So we know it's the cranium. So we are certainly learning together today. Let's switch back to our dark blue sound. The calvary sound. I think such as a, a new term. I very much do like to highlight it. Capital, I guess you pronounce that. Capital. And two parietal bones. Now, parietal to me, I've only heard of in terms of organ systems, which obviously this is, but not in, not in terms of bones. I'm not sure what a parietal bone is. Parietal to me, well, a visceral. And parietal, to me, have always been tied to organs, all types of uh, kind of surrounding tissue. Say, for example, visceral, or membranous tissue, to be ones that completely enclose an organ. Blindly, is that what I think it is? And parietal being, well, the opposite, one that doesn't enclose usually get the smaller side either, or a superior inferior surface or yada yada so on one side or one part not sure if you're closing it oh, I'm sure we'll find out now the cranial base don't worry I'm not going to completely compare all this so we get some general information down cranial base comprised of six bones mm. now these are ones that I Vaguely heard of. Six bones. Let's go down. Six bones. The frontal bone, I presume. The sphenoid. And then finally the parietal and temporal bones. Well, I think I can assume what temporal is. Or occipital, I would assume, is something to do with the eyes. So I think maybe maybe that's what maybe that's the uh, true maybe that's the anatomically correct term for your eye socket. This is my assume uh, assumptions. Frontal would be right at the front. Um well, well we have a picture here. Let me just make this slightly larger for you. Look. Hmm. I think I would do a, a rough sketch of this. The frontal, one of the front in blue. Parietal, just behind, which makes up the seemingly uh, makes up the sides, as you can see from this this one on the, on the right hand side. Occipital is not even slightly what I thought it was. I said the occipital because I thought ocular. It's quite likely that it's involved with the. Uh, the eyes. Oh, not true. Ethmoid seems to be the, the bridge of the nose. Or maybe just. Uh, it's not, not completely. Not completely. What is it? I think it is. I think 
that is what that is. The temporal seems to be the temporal region, so you, you, you have your temporal, uh, you have your temples, don't you? I think everyone knows about the temple, templates. And the spheroid. Now that looks like the eye sockets on the right side. Hmm. Anyway, these bones are important. They provide an articulation point for the first cervical vertebra, as well as the facial bones and the mandible. Most people know that the mandrel is the jawbone. And the first cervical vertebra. Now, your, now your vertebra, the vertebral column, this is something that I do know, might do a little, know a little bit about. Your vertebral column is split into. Is it four? We will see. Is split into your cervical. Now, some people think cervix. Cervical, they think of the cervix, uh, which is part of uh, obviously fe female anatomy. Um, but the cervix, cervical, generally, is actually just means neck or things that are neck like. So, cervical, obviously, is our neck in the neck. Uh, and the cervix, female anatomy, uh, is the neck of that area. Uh, so, it's the neck essentially, it is, you know, it's obviously superior to uh, the vagina. Then you have your lumbar. Hmm, that's not true. No. Thoracic. Let's redo that. Let's do this tax more again. Thoracic. Like your part of your thorax. That's most of your chest. Moving down into your lumbar region, which I think most people would probably. Uh, would have at least heard of lumbar, uh, which is like a lumbar puncture, which is what women have when they're giving birth sometimes. I think most prefer it. Lumbar. Mm. What is the last one? Hmm. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar. See, I always do this. I always do this. I constantly sidetrack. But it's a good way to remember. Sacral. Yes. Stupid, stupid ball. Sacral. And this is fused together, pretty much. And here you have a good uh, diagram of how many different uh, partitions we have within it. So the cervical. Actually, I definitely forgot this. It has seven partitions. Don't look at the ones on the far right. Spinal nerves, that's where that is. Look just left of that on those large bony bits. You can see it more down down here on the inferior side, the inferior aspect. So the cervical has seven uh, vertebrae, thoracic has 12, lumbar has five, and the sacral has five. Well, no, it has one, but it has five. Uh, And as we do with orange, you have two, three, four, five, six, eight that come out of the cervical. You have twelve that come out here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then five for lumbar. One, two, three, four, five. Similar, and they are 
it looks quite uh, quite loud. See, let me show you. I want one full like it was loud door slam. <laughs> This is exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, so you have your vertebrae. This is one vertebral segment, one vertebra. It's not really much point in drawing it out too uh, perfectly. Um, and you have kind of spinous projections that come off it and whatnot, but those are not particularly important for this. For what I'm trying to explain here. So you can see, see that this is a cervical vertebra one. So you have then literally named by number. So, seven, so C1, C2, is that to C, C7, C1, C7. So this thing, this is C1. And you can blow it. Another one. Now, we, the way that the nerve this runs a spinal cord, which is the root for all of our nervous system. From this, spinous nerves comes out. And these nerves innervate all of our body in all manner of ways, sensory, motor. We'll get into that. Now we'll draw the nerve in purple here. Let's draw in pink, which we like now. It's highlighted. So these come down here. come out through here. So this little hole that is it's called a foramen. This little hole. So you have an individual one like this. And it forms a kind of shape like this. The spinous process forms a kind of the bone itself forms this little notch. And on its own it's called a notch. It might be just called the vertebral notch. I think it's not actually on here. I think it is just called the, the, the vertebral notch. But when they come together, as you can see here, so you draw another one underneath there, they kind of lock together. And the two notches put together, notch one, notch two, forms a hole. And in anatomy, we know how holes as foramen. So this is the uh, vertebral foramen, as it says here, intervertebral foramen. So inter between two, between two vertebrae, so inter vertebral foramen. And it's through this foramen that the nerve can escape and then branch off and form different nerves, like yada yada yada. And one comes out of the top here. On C1. So you have C1, C2, C3, C4. And so one comes out of a notch rather than a foramen on C1. So right at the top, you have one that comes out like this. And then from then, from then on, they all start coming out of notches, out of, out of foramen, sorry. So you have one, so you have more, so you have essentially one per foramen. So you have a foramen formed between two, so you have a foramen here. Between one and two, between two and three, between three, three, four, between four and five, between eight, five and six, between six and seven, and between seven and and, and the thoracic one. And T1, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven cervical spinal nerves. And one C1 and C0 is what we call it. So if we try to say which nerve, we can say spinal nerve C01. C1, 2, C2, 3, so on. And that's that explained. I hope that makes sense to you. Let's move on. I absolutely know we're not going to get anywhere in this. I'm going to go into my next lecture. As clear.
clueless as I was before I even started this. So we have the frontal, sphenoid, ethnoid, occipital, parietal, and temporal. facial bones. Let's not do that. Relevant. My lecture tomorrow. Suits of the skull. Now, I did go over this a while ago. A long, long time ago. And I went over it purely out of interest. It was honestly years and years ago. Uh, my girlfriend is actually a, uh, a biomedic PhD student. She does a lot of uh, neuro neuroscience. As a child, and, ch and before you, and before, uh, before you're born, obviously you develop, develop your bones develop. They start out as kind of a cartilaginous kind of mesh, and then they slowly ossify over time. A young child, sort of uh, below one year old, will uh, have far, far, far more anatomically termed bones than us, and we lose bones as we uh, go through puberty, as we develop, get older and older. It's really only after about after about 25 to 30 years old that we have our final set of bones, and that's our lowest number of bones. Uh, some people can lose even more. Some people are born without bone. There's lots of variation in the world, um, but in terms of uh, babies, they have far far more bones, and they're more kind of far more collagenous, cartilaginous. I mean, they fuse together almost what we call as os ossification. So the sutures of the skull are perfect examples. Ossification. You start off with far more uh, broken up skull. So as you can see here, let's actually do this again. Like, let's draw it properly. So, well, properly, it's not particularly dark to draw, is it? So it's skull. So we can have an oval shape. Let's just draw it out. fully developed adult it was a child and so in pink we're going to draw the separations of bones this is what I kind of remember this might not be completely true but uh, it's what I think so we can see that there are separations between the bones the gaps are there on purpose so these two bits are close together but these bits aren't down superiorly inf to inferior, so we're looking down on the skull from above. If this is a, a young child's, a baby's head skull, that is a soft spot. That's why you need to be careful with a child, with, a, with an infant, so below one year old, that's what we know as an infant, because they are, cause because their skulls aren't completely formed, they haven't fully ossified. And sutured together as shown here with these very complex uh, kind of up and down suturings that really tie them together nice and neatly. You have a large spot, in, well, not large, but a spot in the middle of just kind of weak cartilaginous mesh or not bone at all. Um, that if you press down on it, you are pressing through meningeal tissue and touching the brain, and it's very dangerous. So, that is why obviously you don't want to do that. Is literally a soft spot. To the hole in the in the, in the skull. So sutures are a type of fibrous joint that are unique to the skull. They are immovable and fuse completely around the age of twenty. Oh, so that fuses completely by twenty years old. There are other ones that fuse later. Technically, joints, so they are uh, 
segments of the skull. So they are different bones articulating with each other, essentially, which means that they are you know, moving amongst each other, but these ones are immovable, so they aren't moving across each other. They are simply just interactions between two bones, but not moving, as perhaps your... Uh, Your hip bone, your hip bone, as we talked about in our, in our, in our list last video, or in the video before, is several bones articulating across each other, but they are moving. They're moving articulations. They're moving joints. This is a fibrous joint, a joint that does not move. We don't want our skull to move. It's a protective uh, structure, much more than anything else, especially this part of the skull. Sutures are of clinical importance as they can be points of potential weakness in both childhood and adulthood. The main sutures in childhood, or actually, let's, uh, let's quickly uh, annotate our drawing. So this area here, I'm assuming it's of some importance, which must have had some maybe a blue or something. Some importance. Because it's a junction between three. Assuming that could be incorrect, but this is the the frontal fontanelle. Again, might be spelled, might be pronouncing that wrong. Fontanelle, and this is the occipital fontanelle. This. Sagittal suture. And this is the lambdoid suture. Now, time for another detour. Interestingly, now this is anterior. front of the bread, front of the head, got your nose, got your eyes on this side, and here's the back of the head. Coronal and sagittal are anatomical terms that we have obviously taken from these sutures, and this is true. We've taken from these sutures, and we apply them in many other contexts, such as uh, slices that we take out of x-rays, slices that we take out of uh, different sort of fixations with formaldehyde and such, so any cuts that we make through fixations, through uh, prosections or, or dissections, uh, we, we, we name by these sutures. So the coronal suture is named as such. And there, there, are, uh, there are so many other um, examples of this throughout the body. It's, as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anatomical term rather than something that directly relates just specifically to the brain, just such as the word cervical, such as the, the this all this is all um, based off of Latin, Greek usually. And these are Latin, I believe. So, coronal. You might be able to, uh, you might be able to guess. It comes from the word crown or crown, such as a king word would would wear, and it would sit. Here. On top of the head, you know, if you had a crown, it would sit like this, and the weight would be borne mostly at the front of the head. And that's why it's called the coronal suture. Sagittal suture. I'm not sure what sagittal means, um, but it, we use it all the time. Sagittal cuts are cuts that are taken directly through the centre of the body, and it can always be very revealing cross sections and such. So anything that is taken a cross section like this and so you would see for example if you took a cross section of the skull you would see something like see obviously it wouldn't be as a quite such a, such a bad drawing as this these would chance like there or something which kind of goes back and then comes and it comes down doesn't it like that something along that line and this is a 
sacramental suture is here. Sorry, the sagittal suture is here. The radial suture is here. So a sagittal suture would cut straight through, and so this could be a, a, a sagittal, uh, a sagittal uh, aspect or view of the head. Or we say that we mean we've cut straight through, and so we can see all of all of the anatomical structures, so such as the navel, the nasal cavity. Perhaps we can see the layers of the brain. We see the brain itself. We can see cuts of the eyes. We can see cuts of the bones. And so that would be a sagittal uh, view. Lamboid. I'm not so sure. That's not. That's not a. Uh, that's not really a used in, in the same in the same way. Perhaps it is. Perhaps I just don't know about it. I'm not, not, not that I'm aware of. So, the coronal suture freezes. Let's write this down. I'd like to add a little bit of background knowledge to each of these. The coronal suture diffuses. It is these are the parietal sites. So these are parietal. The sagittal suture fuses both parietal bones to each other. Fuses the parietal bones to each other. The lambroid suture fuses the occipital bone to the two parietal bones. This is all very obvious now that you think about the positions of the bones. It fuses Parietals together to uh, the occipital. So at the back, occipital. Easy peasy. In neonates, the incompletely fused suture joints give rise to the membranous gaps between the bones. This is vaguely what I was talking about. Oh, I see that. That's what it means by a fontanelle. fontanelle. Look. The gaps between the bones known as fontanelles. The two major fontanelles are the front fontanelle, located at the junction of the coronal and sagittal sutures, and the occipital fontanelle, located at the junction of the sagittal and lambdoid sutures. Now, clinical relevance. This is always very, very important in medicine for obvious reasons that I go into. The majority of skull fractures result from blunt force or penetrating trauma. This is interestingly something that uh, my girlfriend uh, is solely focused on in her PhD. She is doing a uh, PhD that focuses on um, TBI, which stands for TBI. Let's write that down. Given the significance of this of this section. It stands for traumatic brain injury. And so she's looking at ways that we can try to prevent the, uh, not necessarily obviously the, you can't prevent the onset of it particularly, but uh, the development of the uh, secondary ramifications of traumatic brain injury such as you know if you smash your head in a car accident or you fall off fall off a ladder and hit your head things like that this is traumatic brain injury perhaps even if you get a, a bullet to the, to the brain and it's, it doesn't instantly kill you you can you suffer from traumatic brain injury and who, look, who looks at a kind of 
very specific parts of it, such as using uh, met metabolomic techniques. You should look into it, it's actually very, very interesting. So, back to the, uh, back to the paragraph. Uh, as a result from blunt force or penetrating trauma, and can produce numerous signs and features. Sorry, I'm looking at the kind of an angle behind this microphone. That's why I'm not reading it very, very accurately. And can produce numerous signs and symptoms. It's very vague, it's very helpful. Uh, the clinical features may be obvious, such as physical injuries, bleeding. There are also subtle signs of fracture, such as a clear fluid draining from the ears and nose, and cerebral, sp cerebral spinal fluid, leak indic indicative of a base of skull fracture. This is interesting because the only many hours ago I was in a first aid course, um, the first of, of, of my year, um, and that was one of the main uh, assessments, was this kind of yellowish fluid that could, that could kind of seep out of the, seep out of the ears. So it says clear fluid, but the man today said, um, said yellowish, so I guess it could be both, um, and that is cerebral spinal fluid, so if that comes out and it's not obviously have an ear infection or a nose infection, um, uh, then quite likely it's cerebral spinal fluid which would be indicative of a, of, a, of a traumatic brain injury so in the sense of me doing my first aid course the, the answer was don't move them <laughs> so indicative of basic skull fracture poor balance and confusion as well uh, slurred speech and a stiff neck so I guess these things are poor balance obviously yeah, understandable slurred speech and stiff neck. Those of you all know people that are concussed and suffer from these. There are certain areas of the skull that are natural points of weakness. The pterum, pterum, pterodactyl, pterum, pterium. An H-shaped junction between temporal, parietal, frontal and sphenoid bones the thinnest part of the skull. A fracture here can lacerate the middle and meningeal artery. The, the anterior part resulting in an extradural hematoma. And hematoma is a um, an unnatural kind of accumulation of blood. And this is what we know is a, if, if someone is, is has, has suffered a, a medical emergency and they've fallen over and they're getting sudden swelling in, in their abdomen or in their chest or in their arms or anywhere really. That's indicative of uh, internal bleeding. Hematomerism, yeah. extradural, that obviously means outside or uh, more superficial to the dura, which is a layer of the meninges. Anterior cranial fossa. Now, a fossa is a, well, here we go. <laughs> it says it right here. I don't know why I'm about to uh, go into the anatomical de definition of fossa. The anterior cranial fossa, a depression. So, fossa means a depression. So, for example, your popliteal fossa is the dipping, the kind of triangular dip shape uh, behind your knee. As, it, as you can feel behind your knee, it, it kind of it curves. It's kind of concave. You can really stick your finger in there quite deep if you if you're not squeamish. That's a depression of the skull formed by the frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones. And I think that's probably the bit behind your head. I assume, and that is almost definitely it feels like a pressure point, isn't it? The middle cranial fossa. Ah, see now, there's, there's quite a few of those. So perhaps that is the, the anterior, or it's anterior. So obviously, it would be frontal, ethmoid, and sphenoid bones. It might be the bit right at the top of your top of your nose, top of your nose. Would be good to uh, have examples of these um, sort of images. Perhaps we'll look them up together after this. The middle cranial fossa, depression formed by the sphenoid temporal and the parietal bones. What if we go up? Let's take these down. Let's use the slightly lighter blue. The lightest one on. So the anterior cranial fossa. Frontal. Obviously, we know we've got anterior. 
here and posterior view now, and here from posterior behind. Middle cranial fossa formed a depression formed by the sphenoid temporal and parietal. So parietal is on the side, top of the side, temporal is on the, on the sides. Sorry, front top is uh, the parietal, sides is the temporal, and sphenoid. Maybe the middle cranial fossa is then on your, what we notice there is the temples. And the posterior cranial fossa is the depression right at the back of the back of our head, underneath that kind of knobby bit. And perhaps the anterior cranial fossa is the, the right the bit right at the top of our bridge of our nose. We can confirm these in a second. So the sphenoid temporal and parietals. Squamous. Mm. One of these. The, uh, maybe these are facial. Well, they can't be facial. The squamous mastoid temporal bone plus occipital. Now, the occipital. Ah, I see. I see. So do they go all the way to the back? Because the occipital certainly seems like it would be make up that posterior part, that posterior kind of depression. I just don't know where the squamous and mastoid temporal bones are. If we go to the top, maybe they can explain. It would be, I just have no idea. Did they say squamous? I don't know what these are. Let's have a look. So we have the anterior what was it? The anterior cranials. You can see that my memory is not very good, that's why I have to go for these a million times. Anterior cranial fossa. Can we get a more savage here? No, we do have a good explanation though. So Ah, for God's sake, <laughs> the fossils, did it say it, did it say it, no, or is it has, assume, has it assumed, has it assumed that we would know this? The fossils, as it clearly makes sense. surface anatomy fossils. They are internal anatomical structures. So it is the so at the top. So at the top of this picture, you have the first fossa on the sides here. You have your middle fossas at the back. Have I got right? At the back you have your posterior obviously they they concave. Yes. So obviously these to ignore these uh, sort of Roman numerals, these are all to do with uh, these obviously spinal nerves. So you have the anterior fossa right at the front, and it should draw this out very kind of sketchily. Not sketchily, not sketchy, just as a literal sketch. aspect the anterior cranial fossa Boom. Boom. the medial middle cranial fossa the posterior cranial fossa I expected 
some some of you if you well, I guess you many of you will probably pulling the hair out of me then. Before I'm running back. Before, before I'm running back then. Lovely. That's that large hole at the back through which uh, loads of nerves go. I think probably uh, your um, one of the main ones that I know. Uh, probably well, probably your your uh, brainstem goes through there. I expect. Let's get through this. Let's go a little bit through these clinical. Let's read the rest of this and form a little bit of that. So these are the types of fractures which I believe was that one of the intent intended learning objectives. <laughs> no, it wasn't. We haven't really gone through much. We certainly haven't looked at the Menengi. Maybe we'll do that tomorrow. I make I did another video for that, that specifically on the Menengi. We've looked at how the brain fits. No, we haven't really. We've literally just looked at the craniometric anatomy. Anyway, so depressed. So fractures. There are four main types of cranial fractures. Depressed fractures, which is a fracture of the bone with depression of the bone inwards towards the brain. They occur as a result of a direct blow causing skull indentation with possible underlying brain injury. A linear fracture. A simple break in the bone, traversing its full thickness, so all the way through. They have radiating, stellate fracture lines away from the point of impact, the most common type of cranial fracture. There's a line that goes through, you may as well make a slip. It's a bit larger than the rest. So in this, in this image we have a skull showing depressed fracture of the frontal bone actually seen these, um, in sp these are quite common in sporting injuries. Uh, so, for example, in, in cricket, if you've not been wearing a helmet, uh, you can you can get these, or in, I think in hockey, it's also quite, quite common, well, reasonably common. Uh, obviously very rare, but in terms of skull fractures, this is, is, is well known really with the sport. A hockey puck hits you right on the, right on the frontal, frontal, uh, frontal bone, you can best believe that it could do that. A depressed fracture. They look horrible, don't they? A linear fracture. Yep. This is the most common. So you can imagine if you get a crack and in this kind of radiating way, sort of sort of like that I expect. Like this this line that says A just below. The cracks radiating it radiating. Basal skull fracture. Affects the base of the skull. They characteristically present with bruising behind the ears, known as battles sign. Mastoid ecchymosis, ecchymosis, or bruising, bruising around the eyes, orbits, known as raccoon's eyes. Diastatic is a fracture that occurs along a suture line, causing a widening of the suture. They are most often seen in children, and as we, as I've, I vaguely touched on myself. You can probably see why that might happen. The sutures are less uh, fused together, so it's understandable how that might happen. And then we've got some clinical relevant uh, clinically relevant uh, relevance of the facial bones, so there's facial fractures. And that's it for this for this slide, for this um, this page. Really. of the brain. We've simply looked, looked at the uh, predictive role. I mean, we haven't really looked at that either. Perhaps, perhaps we should go over this. No, I think we should leave it. We're coming up to about an hour already. So, thank you for for, for viewing. If you viewed all the way to the end, then well done. Kind of, uh, kind of putting up with my ramblings. I hope you found it interesting. I 
even though it's, I quite like doing these this way, I've got a vague idea of what we want to go over. It's good if we get through these sort of learning objectives. If not, then no harm done, really. I think we've still, if you if you don't know about these kind of things, hopefully you found it interesting. So uh, thanks a lot for for watching. Um, yeah, I hope you have a hope you have a good rest of your day.